Are we live? Yeah. Good afternoon from Aries Nainital. Uh, greetings from Aries. Welcome to the Aries e lecture series number seven. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, upcoming solar facilities uh, from India. But before I uh, get from, into that, uh, before I get into that subject, I must uh, have to uh, first tell you what are the solar facilities uh, available today uh, from India. And then also uh, I would like to emphasize why do we need uh, new facilities in the context of uh, solar physics, our current understanding and so on. And then I will talk about two major projects which we have undertaken. One is from the space platform and uh, the other one is from the ground based uh, facility. So, uh, so let's move on. I think the slide changer. Okay. So, the first uh, point which I would like to emphasize is about uh, multi wavelength, because modern day astronomy is done by, you know, multi wavelength observations. So what you see first is at the top uh, is this uh, electromagnetic spectrum where you notice that uh, you have the longer wavelengths uh, and then we go uh, to the shorter and shorter wavelengths. This is the visible wavelength and then shorter wavelengths uh, are UV, X-rays and gamma rays. So today uh, what I will be emphasizing again and again, why do we need to look at uh, the sun with multiple wavelengths. As you can see here, there are four images uh, shown of the sun here. So the left two images, this one is taken from infrared and the other one is taken from uh, optical uh, telescope. And these two wavelengths you can actually uh, observe from the ground. So here you could see there are two telescopes which are shown, uh, both are from, uh, from US and then on the right side, you see a ultraviolet uh, telescope solar dynamic observatory, uh, which is looking at, uh, you know, extreme ultraviolet uh, wavelengths. And then what you can do is when you look at these extreme ultraviolet wavelengths, you see higher temperature emission from the solar atmosphere. And if you go even higher temperature uh, plasma uh, probe, which is primarily the, the X-rays, and then you need an X-ray telescope. As, as you know, that these wavelengths from uh, uh, this side of the plot is accessible from the ground, whereas uh, the shorter and shorter wavelengths are not accessible from the ground. So that means you have to go to space platform. So if you really want to uh, do a proper study of the sun, you essentially need to combine your observations from the ground and from space. The other thing is when you go to space, then also you have certain limitations in terms of you know how big the telescopes can be, how much data you can collect and how much data you can download and so on. Uh, so there are certain limitations. Whereas when you look uh, at the sun from the ground, then you can build very large uh, you know telescopes which can look at much more details of the sun. But as I pointed out already that you are limited by your wavelength coverage. So this is what is the overall you know breadth of things which we would like to do for modern day solar physics. Now as I pointed out, I will briefly talk about uh, you know our facilities which is there from India. Uh, solar facilities only I am talking about today. As you can see the north part of India in this uh, Uttarakhand uh, from Aryabhata Research Institute, we have this H-alpha telescope here which looks at the atmosphere again in the lower atmosphere uh, and, and study the flares, uh, some dynamics on the sun and so on. More recently, uh, there has been a new telescope uh, installed in this beautiful lake site called Udaipur uh, Lake and this is uh, Udaipur Solar Observatory which is under Physical Research Laboratory and Department of Space. Historically, uh, Kudekanal Solar Observatory is one of the oldest observatories in the country and that's situated uh, way in the south and this is the solar tunnel telescope and I will be briefly talking about it uh, uh, you know, in my next slides as well. So those are optical telescopes. 
there are also radio telescopes this is uh, one of the largest uh, you know giant meter radio telescopes uh, uh, maintained by by a national center for radio astronomy tifr near pune primarily it is uh, you know dedicated for extra galactic astronomy but uh, you can also look at the sun uh, with certain specific uh, constraints then we have uh, at gauri bidanur in in the south again close to uh, karnataka uh, we have uh, uh, a, a radio heliograph this is maintained by indian institute, uh, indian institute of astrophysics and some of my colleagues uh, work very actively on this so apart from looking at pulsars and other uh, astronomical objects uh, it is dedicated for solar observations as well then also in the south we have another telescope called uh, uh, uti radio telescope this is again maintained by national center for radio astronomy and uh, it, it, it based on the interplanetary scintillations it looks at solar uh, you know outer atmosphere and heliosphere and so on and so forth so these are the radio facilities uh, within the country uh, as i pointed out this is the beautiful udaipur solar uh, observatory on udaipur lake um, udaipur solar observatory has very recently you know installed a new telescope a modern telescope which is a 50 cm off axis uh, Uh, you know telescope this was built by a belgian company called amos incidentally this is the same company which has built the largest uh, nighttime telescope in india as well which is situated in devasthal it has capabilities of doing uh, you know imaging uh, for technical uh, you know if somebody is interested in technical specifications i can get back to it later on but for general audience just be aware that it has uh, abilities to do you know simultaneous imaging of the photosphere and chromosphere chromosphere is the you know uh, is a layer of the atmosphere which is about say between 1000 km to 2000 km from the solar surface it also has the ability to do polarimetry as we now know that uh, polarization uh, allows us to you know get an estimate about the magnetic field of the sun and as i pointed out in my previous lecture and probably today again and again that the magnetic field plays a crucial role in controlling the dynamics so measurements of the magnetic field and its evolution with time is the crucial you know element which we are looking for and then also there is a uh, possibility of a multi slit spectra polarimetry this is a very interesting experiment this is a combination of spectroscopy and polarimetry which uh, which is being tested now at udaipur and uh, i i will talk about it in, in my last uh, part of my lecture where from the space platform also we will be attempting to do this so this is again a very interesting aspect why do we need a ground based telescope is before we go to space often we need to actually verify our new understanding on also new instrumentation first is the ground base because we have possibilities of doing lots of experiment and trial and error and so on whereas you know in space platform we cannot do it once everything is is finalized settled then only we can build a, a instrument which can be flown into space so that is another reason that the combination of ground based uh, observations and space based observations are crucial for improvement of uh, uh, astrophysics in general so these are the facilities in udaipur solar observatory as you can see the the telescope is in the, the top dome but basically all the scientists uh, always sit in the underground and uh, here is this uh, you know uh, the light uh, falls into this uh, table and then the, the light uh, is Uh, detected by different instruments and so on i have to talk about kodaikanal solar observatory this is uh, observatory of the indian institute of astrophysics located in the beautiful palani range of hills in southern india and it was actually established in 1899 so more than 120 years back and this was the first solar observatory uh, uh, in the country and majority of the activities which were happening in the madras observatory even other astronomical observations they were all shifted to kodaikanal so there were famous discoveries made from this kodaikanal observatory of course the it was under the british rule so there were the several british astronomers who were uh, several directors of the kodaikanal solar observatory uh, in those times so this is the top image what you could see is at the top of the hill uh, we have a 6 inch uh, telescope in fact uh, uh, for last 120 years every morning one particular gentleman goes up not the same gentleman but of course at different times different people uh, go up uh, into this 
and uh, take an image of the sun. So this is the white light image of the sun taken from Kodai Canal Solar Observatory for last 120 years from the same telescope. So you can imagine probably in the world there are not many such facilities still existing. So this has lots of archival and historical value as well. So Kodai Canal Solar Observatory provides a, you know, a archival resources I will be talking about also. This is the place where we have a, a, a nice little auditorium and we conduct our seminars and, uh, and the winter schools and summer schools in this. So if uh, some of you have already might have visited, if not, then look for opportunities when this next uh, summer school or winter school is announced, you will be having the opportunity to sit inside this uh, old building and uh, attend to lectures. So again in the Kodai Canal Solar Observatory, we have this uh, solar tower tunnel telescope. Uh, it, is, it has a high resolution uh, solar observational facilities and then there is a spectroheliograph here and this building is more than 100 years old and uh, sun has been observed for continuously for last uh, more than 100 years and we have again you know digitized all those data which has been collected and one of my students I think later on will be talking about it in the e-lecture series. Again, I wanted to point it out, point out that, you know, this is a, a, one of the oldest libraries in Asia. I mean, this is again an active library, which is more than 100 years old. You will find books uh, from uh, 1901 onwards. And now, more recently, we have uh, installed a, a twin telescope, which looks at again the sun on white light. That means the photospheric height and also calcium, which takes an image in the chromosphere. So we have possibilities of observing the sun at multiple layers. Incidentally, from the ground-based facilities also, today what we try to do is multi-wavelength. If you just look at one wavelength, you get information about only one height in the solar atmosphere. So as much possible, you can have multiple wavelength observations from ground. But as I pointed out, you can't really go to very high in the atmosphere because the highest layers of the atmosphere of the sun is very hot and they emit in very short wavelengths, primarily in ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet and X-rays. So you need to go to space to make those observations. So here again, this is the solar tower tunnel telescope. Uh, you see this image, uh, the, the tunnel is actually underneath this uh, building. And then more recently, we have installed a, a, a H-alpha telescope. This H-alpha telescope uh, uh, is also there in one of the locations in Ladakh. I will talk about it uh, re, uh, you know, later as well. And then we also have a celostat kind of arrangement. This is called the white light uh, monitor. And it has the capabilities of, again, looking at the sun from multiple wavelengths. So different filters can be installed. And you see this is the lab where this uh, light beam is entered into the lab. And then you can you do these observations here. So this is the, so, so much you know, it's a, uh, you know, about the new facilities, I would say, existing facilities in India in terms of solar observation. As I pointed out that uh, from Kodai Canal, uh, we have been taking solar images in multi-wavelength again. So this is an example that's 1st January 1958, a, a white light image. Then uh, you go slightly high up in the atmosphere uh, at the same day, 1st January 1958, a calcium image and then an H alpha image which forms slightly higher again in the atmosphere of the sun on the same day. So the point I am going to emphasize here is it's a unique resource in India and probably, probably unique in the world, in the globe, that such an archive exists. So more recently, we have digitized all these images which were taken with the photographic plates and the later on with films uh, into now digital form. So all those digital images are available in this website. And, uh, you know, quite a few of my students actually working on this uh, project now. It has enormous resources and uh, for the long term study of the sun you know, how it impacts our, our climate and so on and so forth, one can study from these long base uh, data. And uh, if you are interested, one can do a lot of projects also from this kind of uh, data. So one can uh, contact uh, me later on if you are interested to study these uh, subject areas. So that was about the current, uh, you know, facilities. Now I will step into the future facilities. This is one from the ground called the National Large Solar Telescope in short NLST. This is, uh, you know, is, is a proposed 2 meter class telescope that will address critical problems in astrophysics. 
and the site is called Mirak and uh, probably some of you will be able to identify this beautiful lake called Pangong Lake. Uh, if you have seen a famous movie uh, of three idiots, uh, you will recognize this lake uh, site quite easily. It's outstanding world-class site. So I will be talking about this project uh, uh, during my presentation next. So why this kind of large solar telescope from Indian soil is so important? What is shown here is a global map. And as you can see here, there are three red circles. So here, this is a location where very recently there has been a new telescope which has been uh, seen its first light. It's called Haile Kela. It is in Hawaii Island. It's an American telescope. Uh, it's, uh, it's the largest solar telescope in the world now. It's a four meter class telescope. Then there is this location is in the California. Uh, it's called Big Bear Solar Observatory, which has a 1.6 meter telescope. And then if you go here to, uh, to the coast of Africa, more closer to Europe, uh, this is a European uh, uh, you know, uh, telescope, uh, again 1.5 meter, uh, and there, is, there are also slightly smaller 1 meter kind of telescope from these islands, which are situated they are called Canary Islands, uh, namely the Ten uh, Tenerife and La Palma. These are the two islands where several telescopes, actually nighttime uh, telescopes are also there. So there are some solar facilities here. So if you notice now that in this uh, part of the uh, you know, uh, globe, there's hardly any big solar telescope. Of course, this uh, Udaipur solar telescope, which I have mentioned, is 50 centimeter. Actually, what you need is a bigger and bigger telescopes give you more and uh, finer details or higher resolution images on the sun. I will emphasize on that. So here, this is the location where we are planning for this Pangong Lake is this telescope. So you can see that you know, when we look at the sun first, because as you know, sun uh, set, uh, rises from, uh, from east, so these people are all sleeping. So if you are really looking at some solar events and so on, it's a very, very good opportunity for us to look at that particular event from this part of the globe. Also, what is important is for a better understanding of the solar features and its, its, uh, its dynamics, a continuous observation of those events or those features. So as you can imagine here now that without this uh, yellow circle here, these three telescopes will not be able to follow all solar you know, features or solar activity continuously. So this way, this uh, region needs a big solar facility very, very badly. So this is an absolute must for global solar community, so to say. So NLST, the international co context, say so as I mentioned, this new solar telescope, uh, which is there in, in Big Bear uh, Solar Observatory is, uh, is functional for, uh, for, for last one, one decade almost. Then of course, the German telescope uh, Gregor, which I mentioned uh, is at Tenerife. It's again, uh, you know, uh, functioning quite, uh, quite well. NLST, you know, we have projected it to have the first light around 2025 if we get the money very, very soon. This is a, you know, in the final stages of approval from the government and we hope to get the funding very soon. Then this is uh, earlier it used to be called Advanced Technology Telescope, ATST, but now it has been renamed as DKIST. This is the largest solar telescope, 4 meter, which is uh, situated in this Hawaii island and uh, it got its first light in the last part of last year. And these are the two projected uh, big solar facility, the European uh, Solar Technology Telescope, EST. This is a consortium of uh, European countries. They plan to have the telescope somewhere in Tenerife, but again, uh, this is not an approved project and nobody knows when it will have the first light, not before 2028 at least. And then similarly, the Chinese are looking at uh, possibilities of a very, very large, uh, they call it a giant solar telescope. And that time scale is also beyond 2028 because it's still not an approved uh, project and they have not even got a site uh, yet. So these are, uh, you know, future projects. So that way NLSG, if it comes in four or five years time scale from now, we will really be able to do frontline science along with our colleagues across the globe. Why do you need NLST? So, just a little brief history. Uh, NLST is a two meter class uh, telescope with an innovative design. And uh, this was initiated uh, actually more than uh, 14 years. 
and we had to go undergo lots of studies in terms of which site will be uh, ideal for such uh, placing such a telescope, what should be its uh, design, what should be its uh, back end instruments. So it takes a long time to you know uh, materialize for this kind of project you can see it. So the site characterization started in 2007 and we are still continuing our site uh, survey but of course the final site is already selected so to, I, will, I will share more uh, on that. So the scientific objective of this is high spatial resolution to resolve sub arc second magnetic elements. So this is I will emphasize a little more in my next slide. What do you mean by you know uh, high spatial resolution and uh, what is this uh, you know sub arc second uh, word means and what are these magnetic elements? So we have uh, followed a design which is a uh, you know on axis Gregorian type. This is a German telescope which is fully functional. So we essentially followed its its. Uh, it's a sort of style, but of course the design is quite innovative and very, very different from the German telescope. So the broad scientific requirement is to look at this uh, small scale uh, structures. Can we play this uh, movie uh, here? Can you just check whether you can play this movie? I will talk on meanwhile. Okay, so essentially uh, what we are talking about is this uh, small uh, structures. Uh, when you have a very large telescope, then only you can achieve a high resolution. And when I say high resolution of say 0.1 arc second, it actually means uh, 70 kilometer uh, on the surface of the sun. What is shown here in this particular image or a movie here is the location of the magnetic flux concentrations on the sun taken from a space, uh, you know, uh, magnetic uh, field imager where it clearly shows the locations where large scale magnetic fields are there. Now, you also see that, so these uh, strong field regions are called so called active region and I think I mentioned earlier also that the other part of the sun where there is no such huge concentration of field or large sized uh, magnetic field these are called quiet regions but what you notice here is in these quiet regions there are salt and paper you know everywhere these salt and paper actually means opposite magnetic polarities and if i actually take a small little box here and zoom it up here, here you see these small little salt and paper, how dynamic they are, how fast they are moving and so on and so forth. And again, some again ground based observations are revealing much more dynamic things which are happening here. So these are called vortex flows. So you can see in nature also, uh, you know, vortexes are, uh, vortices are seen. Of course, the uh, recent uh, cyclone in, in Bengal was an extreme uh, example of such vortices, but here, small scale vortices in on the sun you see all the time and of course when i say small scale uh, in the sun it is 70 80 kilometers so that's not small in our uh, our nature as well so basically the point is if you want to really study such you know high resolution dynamics with the very fast uh, images and and so on you need a much bigger size telescope so this is one of the main scientific objectives of, um, of having a large telescope from the ground. So apart from these uh, studying these big, big uh, active regions, so this quiet sun, which is all the time there, uh, it is very important to uh, study what is their effect. And I will talk about it uh, briefly that these small scale fields and their dynamics also plays a crucial role in controlling the dynamics in the higher atmosphere and what we talk about, about the heating of the higher atmosphere and so on and so forth. As I pointed out earlier as well, the corona, uh, uh, the extreme uh, outer layers of the sun is very hot. And how do you get this, uh, you know, uh, energy to the corona to maintain it to, to, to such high temperature? So now we understand that all these dynamics which is happening in the photospheric surfaces. So this is an image taken from the photosphere, which is the surface of the sun and their dynamics actually generates lots of waves and then they, they carry. Also, you see one more element of things that this is black guys and the white guys, they are actually coming to each other and they are killing each other. So this is what is called flux cancellation. 
So when these two kind of opposite magnetic polarities will come closer to each other and they will cancel their magnetic fluxes, that energy will get converted into other forms of energy, mainly the kinetic energy and the, and the heat and so on. So the flux cancellation is again another very big you know, uh, mechanism which, uh, which supplies this energy, apart from these dynamics and their, their waves and all that. And incidentally, all these uh, uh, white and black patches, what we are referring at salt and paper here, are the foot points of flux tubes. I did mention it earlier as well. So it is like uh, uh, the rubber tubes, what you can see. These are very highly concentrated uh, magnetic field regions where the plasma, which is, uh, you know, highly ionized, they are confined and so on and so forth. So these are, uh, you know, if you want to do some physics, then this uh, processes which you want to describe them is called the magneto hydrodynamic processes. So if people are interested in hydrodynamical research with a strong magnetic field presence and so on and so forth, there are a lot of research problems one can find from there. So, so I will not talk about too much here, but if people are interested, please feel free to contact me. I will be happy to discuss much more detail on those elements. This is again another example which I showed last time as well that uh, these quite some, uh, you know, multi observation what is giving you here at the bottom layer, which is the surface of the sun. What you see here, this is taken from this uh, Goody Solar Telescope in, in Big Bear Solar Observatory. One of my students is the lead author of this. And as you can imagine, again, this uh, particular work is uh, published in science, but people from all over from, you know, uh, my student uh, who, who was a postdoc uh, in China. So he's Chinese supervisor, then, uh, then people from different parts of Europe, uh, myself, and then, and, and then the Americans. So it's, it's an ideal example of uh, you know combining uh, resources and data as collected from ground based so these three layer observations are taken from ground based telescope which uh, has given you the magnetic field information here then you get a little photosphere this this kind of granular pattern which i did talk about last time also that uh, the solar surface shows the manifestation of the convection which happens below the surface if you boil a soup then you see this kind of pattern all the time. When the soup is fully boiled, you see this kind of cellular structures on the surface of your bowl. And this is nothing but uh, convection. So sun is convective underneath the surface is uh, proven when somebody takes an image of the photosphere, which is the visible surface of the sun. This image is taken again uh, from a titanium oxide filter, which again maps one particular height in the photosphere. And it shows very nicely how these granular structures are there and how these granular structures or pattern is changing with time. That is what actually is most important, that there are certain changes which happens uh, in those magnetic flux concentrations. Here, what is shown is the magnetic flux concentrations in by two different colors. There is one dark blue is one polarity and the red one is the other polarity. And here, what uh, Tonmoy showed is that because of this flux cancellation, you have certain jet kind of features. This has been, uh, a, you know, even more manifested here when we look at slightly higher up in the atmosphere and you clearly see the presence of these jets. So these jets are nothing but ejecta coming out of the magnetic flux uh, cancellation events. So these jets are called also spicules. And then uh, the other thing which Tonmoy uh, studied is what is the response of these jets when these jets reach higher up in the corona. So this particular observation is taken from again a space observatory called Solar Dynamic Observatory which has a filter which, uh, uh, which is centered at 171 Armstrong which maps uh, typically 0.8 million Kelvin temperature plasma and as you can see here whenever there is a jet actually there is a exact brightening seen on those. So there is a direct evidence that these jets can carry enough amount of energy and hit the higher atmosphere. So this is again the reason why I'm showing this is why do we need such facilities of high resolution ground based observation and space based observation. This is the, uh, the theme of my talk and this particular example shows that abilities of uh, the best uh, ground based facilities from, uh, from US and the space facilities from NASA, we have been able to, you know, get into this kind of science. I will talk about a little bit again, coming back to the NLST. This is the design activities. Uh, this is the building of, uh, of NLST, which will look like 
this is the telescope uh, structure there are lots of studies why do you need a dome whether you need a dome at, at, at all uh, so there are a lot of technicalities and interestingly these are the subject areas again where we need a lot of engineers the engineering uh, you know technological advancement uh, if we cannot implement in these projects we can't get a cutting edge new facility so this is again a very good example where i would uh, say that different kind of engineering expertise this is a uh, you know all this slide is made you know made by one of my uh, mechanical engineering colleague and as you can see here that how nicely the detailed design has been worked out and then uh, with the combination of optical engineers the electronic engineer the you know the computer scientist and then you know mechanical engineer along with the with the you know uh, physicist these projects has to be executed so this is again a, a good platform for me to share that these projects which are upcoming uh, facilities there are a lot of provisions for youngsters to participate in this and take it uh, or take us to the next level of uh, technology this is the village uh, where i took the image because we uh, stay in the small little hut in this so that's a lake what you can see there called tangong lake incidentally the location where the 3d uh, was uh, shot it's still you know uh, about uh, 15 kilometers uh, to the left so this area is still not uh, completely tourist zone i must point out so and the right side is uh, more towards uh, china so this is a, a little intrusion in the lake we are planning to build a telescope in the intrusion the advantage is that the lake actually uh, allows us for a very nice laminar flow and this laminar flow of air is very useful to take away some of the heat which is generated in the mirror of the primary of the telescope there are a lot of technical details on that if again people are interested please get back to me so what you can see here there is a tower so we are doing and then a small little huts there there is a small little uh, uh, car also approaching this every morning we approach that that way it's about 3 kilometers away what the uh, image is taken of course in this uh, in the winter it's all bit frozen uh, these are images taken by me and uh, this is the house where we stay and as you can imagine even if you are in a very remote location what you need is only this dish as long as you have this dish uh, you are not uh, you know alone in the world and uh, you could enjoy the world as well at beautiful nature uh, in your surrounding and as you can see this image uh, i took a few years back in a in a winter uh, uh, morning the lake is completely frozen the lake is, which is 3 km uh, you know wide this way gets completely frozen and it stays frozen for almost 4 uh, months in a year at least if not longer so this is a beautiful location uh, sometimes the you know as you can see this is a frozen lake and then you have a little you know crack this is actually dangerous uh, because if you start walking and it starts cracking it's not a very pleasant uh, you know uh, thing to happen so these are small little uh, you know frp huts which are there where inside it's pretty comfortable there we have we, we have uh, computers and internet and so on so no worries now how do we choose this particular uh, site as a, one of the best sites so this is called the site survey incidentally this is uh, three images uh, the three locations in india which we focused on this was the mirak pangong lake which finally we selected but then again we also have a very high mountain site uh, location called hanle where indian institute of astrophysics is also uh, you know having a huge uh, astronomical facilities and primarily we have a night time telescope and uh, more than one uh, night time facilities and now new gamma ray telescope is also coming up and so on the other site is of course devasthal where the uh, the biggest uh, night time telescope 3.6 meter is there but unfortunately devasthal what we realized it actually uh, suffers from monsoon so uh, this part of the himalayas get lot of rain and we almost uh, lose uh, 3 months uh, at least uh, time in a year uh, uh, you know for observation whereas these ladakh regions are uh, very dry they are called cold deserts of course they are much higher altitude as well so this is only 2500 meters and this is uh, 4000 meters and above so that makes a big difference in terms of the the cloud coverage and so on so we did this survey with a battery of instruments i will not again uh, go into the details there are many many instruments uh, all sky cameras 
uh, sky radiometers uh, and, and so on all weather stations micro thermal tower as you uh, as you saw this uh, this, this is a big uh, tower which measures uh, temperature and other parameters at different heights in the atmosphere and so on so we had battery of instruments uh, which we uh, placed in these three locations and and monitored this and eventually by comparing all the results we decided that the medic will be the best site for setting up a ground based solar facility so again these are the more recent uh, images uh, we have installed recently a, a, a h alpha telescope as i mentioned from kurekala we have a h alpha telescope exactly same uh, kind of telescope was installed uh, uh, recently about a couple of years back there and in fact uh, this is the active region uh, you know during september so in the last uh, you know solar cycle this was the strongest flare which was observed from uh, from there from this uh, telescope and uh, you can see this is an animation from that uh, 20 centimeter small telescope of course we are looking at a 2 meter glass telescope but this again proves that uh, the site is uh, pretty good to capture now again getting into the uh, the space platform i will show you another movie that why do we need a multi wavelength so this is again i'm repeating again and again but this is the key of this this is again a movie made from the recent uh, uh, results which uh, Tonmoy worked on and a combination of uh, ground based facilities you see this granular pattern and then this jets uh, uh, as observed from chromosphere uh, from the, with the same Goody telescope and uh, here you see again these jets are very nicely and these jets are coming from those boundaries those layers where the magnetic field concentrations are. So this is again a direct evidence that these magnetic polarities of opposite, uh, you know, nature, they come closer to each other and then the moment they come closer to each other, they cancel each other and then these uh, jets are formed and these jets form and goes higher up in the atmosphere. This is a movie taken from a solar dynamic observatory from, from space. So here again, these boxes shows you the location where these, you know, heatings are taking place because of the jets reaching in the high in the corona. So I'm emphasizing that this is important to have uh, a combination of ground-based and space-based facility to do modern day science. So this is, I'm coming back to the first, uh, uh, observe, uh, you know, slide that from US also, you see they have ground-based facilities and the space-based facilities. We are so fortunate that from India, we are now able to think about a, a combination of a world-class ground-based facility and a world-class space-based facility. That's called Aditya. Aditya is a dedicated India space mission to study the sun. Of course, it is a multi-institutional uh, project. There are several uh, parts of ISRO's uh, centers are involved for hardware and science. As you can see here, that there are many institutes across India are playing major role uh, in, in this, uh, you know, in this observatory. So essentially, this is a solar observatory from space. And the other thing which I wanted to emphasize is, this is again a unique example of an observatory where we have multi-wavelength capability. Basically, we have, I will show you, we have infrared observation possible, we have optical observation possible, we have ultraviolet observation possible and also X-ray observation possible from the same platform. So Aditya is going to be a unique, uh, you know, laboratory in space, unique observatory in space, which, which will have all capabilities of doing observations on the sun. This is a complete list of payloads. There are seven payloads uh, going to be on this uh, uh, platform. The visible line coronagraph, coronagraph is, a is an uh, a instrument which blocks the solar disk to look at the outer atmosphere of the sun, so called the corona and it will have three visible uh, channels and one infrared channels as I mentioned uh, uh, you know, before it's a multivalent. Then we have a, a full disk uh, solar ultraviolet imaging telescope which will be built by, uh, by IUCA. So uh, this visible line Corona graph is the, actually the big elephant sitting on the top deck of this uh, and this is uh, being built at Indian Institute of Astrophysics in collaboration with many ISRO centers and other institutes across India. And this near UV uh, you know, telescope will work within 200 to 400 nanometer, will look at the full disk image of the sun. It also has uh, particle uh, detectors because the other thing which I will not probably have too much time to discuss with today 
that this particular satellite is going to a position called Lagrangian one point. So this is far away from sun. So typically the, so, uh, the satellites uh, walk in most of the near, uh, uh, near Earth. So there are different type of geostationary or, or, or you know, sun synchronous orbits. But this time we are going far away from Earth. Essentially 1.2.7 lakh kilometer away, uh, a location called uh, Lagrangian one point. And Lagrangian one point is a point between the sun and Earth. So if some explosion happens on the sun, those particles, those material has to pass through the satellite to reach us. So if you want to study those particular uh, events, uh, which are harmful for our Earth's atmosphere and our own satellites, this is the ideal location. So that's why we are going to Lagrangian one point. So this is one particular, uh, you know, uh, particle detector, which will work in 20 keV to 20 MeV region. Then we also have another particle detector, which will look at slightly smaller energy bands, 10 EeV to 3 keV with a little overlap. And then uh, we have two X-ray spectrometers, one as a low energy spectrometer, uh, which will work uh, between 1 to 30 keV. And then there is a high energy uh, spectrometer called Helios, which will work in 10 to 150 keV. So these two are built at uh, different locations of, uh, of Department of Space. Uh, and, and even this uh, two particle experiments will be also built by uh, Physical Research Laboratory, which is also in the Department of Space, and this one as a space physics uh, laboratory. Then the seventh instrument is a magnetometer to measure the magnetic uh, magnitude and nature of interplanetary magnetic field. So, uh, Laboratory for Electro Optic System, LEOS at Beng Bangalore, uh, in concentration with, uh, with uh, Isaac and, and Bangalore. Uh, they are building this uh, magnetometer instrument. So these are a suite of seven instruments and as you can see that it also covers all wavelengths from visible infrared to ultraviolet and then to x-rays and so on. So this is a unique, unique possibility for us now. Future is very bright. So this is a, a stout view of Aditya L1. As you can see in the top deck, this is the coronagraph. As I said, this is the big elephant which is sitting in the top. This is the main bulk of the payload, I could say. We'll look at the sun with four different cameras. Then uh, this uh, near UV full disk imager is sitting next to uh, uh, the coronagraph. And then the, the different particle detectors and the X-ray uh, spectrometers are much smaller in size. And they are uh, situated at different locations in this diagram. So it's a combination of what we call remote sensing and in situ. Remote sensing means when you are at a Lagrangian one point, you are looking at the sun all the time. You are remotely looking at the sun and sensing what is happening in the sun. So you will study the dynamics with a combination of uh, images, uh, which will be given by this solar, solar ultraviolet imaging telescope. This is, uh, will look at the solar disk image and the coronagraph will look at the outer atmosphere of the sun. Coronagraph will also have possibility of imaging. It will image from 1.05 solar radii to 3 solar radii. So this is the box through which we will be studying the dynamics in the corona. And then we will also have a possibility of doing spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is the only way you could uh, then talk about the emission mechanisms or the plasma which is emitting this particular line. So there are high temperature plasma present in the corona and those high temperature plasma emits different ionization states of different elements. So these are called uh, spectral lines and while studying many different spectral lines and comparing their uh, properties, we could talk about the, the density of those plasma, we could talk about any velocities which is associated with that plasma or the temperature of the plasma. So this is a very, uh, you know, very much required for doing uh, astronomy or astrophysics that you have a combination of imaging capability and spectral capability. So for a modern day astrophysics, this is a very much a required element. And uh, fortunately from Aditya, from this coronagraph, we have the possibilities of both. Then on the right side, what it shows is the energy spectrum of this uh, 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 the low energy X-ray spectrometer and the high energy X-ray spectrometer. So essentially, these uh, spectrometers will look at 
for very dynamic events in the sun at solar atmosphere which are, which are called flares i did talk about it briefly the other day and if you are interested again uh, we can uh, have uh, further discussions so this is why uh, we need uh, the inner corona to be uh, looked at uh, so there are several coronagraphs in space at ground but why do we need again another coronagraph in space so we have to always justify that this is an example or an image uh, taken from a Lasco C2 coronagraph which blocks the solar disk but it can image the solar disk beyond 2.5 solar radii. I mean it had some capabilities of imaging of from 2 solar radii but because of technical reasons it hardly could image anything uh, less than 2.5 solar radii. There was another coronagraph uh, in, uh, in SOHO spacecraft which is called C1 but unfortunately that C1 coronagraph only worked for two years and that it uh, got uh, uh, you know, malfunctioned in, in space and it could not give any data beyond 1998. So we essentially do not have a space coronagraph which can look very close to the sun. So this is the portion where you know there are certain dynamics which happens which we are missing today. Of course there are ground based coronagraph which can achieve that. But ground based, you know, there are a lot of problems in terms of the ground scattering and also weather and so on. So for continuous observations of coronagraph from the ground is very, very difficult. Of course, the best uh, possibility of looking at the corona is during total solar eclipse. Because what happens is moon nicely blocks the solar disk and moon is far away from us. So the scattered light because of this blocked uh, uh, disk or blocked surface is uh, very less which reaches earth so if we have a telescope situated at the at the ground we hardly see any scattered light from this blocked moon so the image of the uh, corona looks so pretty as you can see from this total solar eclipse but as you know total solar eclipses are very rare and uh, we really can't uh, really wait for our science to only for total solar eclipses and uh, total solar eclipses also the duration of the total solar eclipses are very short so it's uh, you have to be very fortunate to capture all the dynamics what you are interested in and so on so uh, aditya uh, coronagraph uh, the way it is designed now is very much essential uh, for uh, what is available today so this is what we will be looking at from the coronagraph very nicely the eclipse images in the background uh, we hope to take these images uh, you know any time uh, we like after the aditya is in space this is also an uh, uh, you know overlap of image of the of the multi slit experiment which we are going to do as i mentioned the uh, the spectroscopy so spectroscopy and imaging in combination will allow us to study the dynamics much much better this is again a blow up of that uh, different locations where our slits will be wherever these red lines are there those mark the locations of the slits and uh, all those locations we will have spectral information so as i talking about I was talking about the different diagnostic capabilities will be fully available in these different uh, locations where the red line is. The other interesting aspect of the sun is sun do change quite a lot with time. Here you see a collage of image. This is eclipse image taken in 2006. Then the next one is 2008 and then 2009 and 2010. As you see, the sun really changes with year as well. Of course, sun changes in the time scales of minutes to seconds to hours, but also it changes uh, in the time scales of months to years. So we need to study these different dynamic changes by different ways. So that means we need a satellite which should last for many, many years in space. And uh, thankfully, it appears that since we are going to a Lagrangian one point, uh, it is possible to stay there for a very long period of time because once you reach there, it's a much stable position and once you reach there, then you can stay there. You need very little fuel to uh, be exhausted and you can stay there uh, for a very long time, at least five years, if not uh, you know, much, much longer. Incidentally, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, which is an ESA and NASA satellite, which is now placed in L1, was launched in 1995 and it is still there. So, it is possible to look at the sun with, with a very, very long time line. Uh, this is an object called coronal mass ejection. As you see, huge explosion on the sun. 
the right side uh, here on this uh, is the surface closer to the sun and then when such an explosion happens it travels all the way through the solar corona and to the inner heliosphere and then we are somewhere here and then which, which impacts us. So this is a, a movie taken from a stereo spacecraft which has a combination of UV imager uh, which is this blue things then it has uh, uh, two coronagraphs called core 1 and core 2 uh, and then the heliospheric imager which looks at the heliosphere, the distance between the sun and the earth. So combining all these three different information, we could now study the propagation of these CMEs and when it will reach us, if at all it will reach us or not. And if it reaches us, then what are all things it is carrying so that it is harmful for our atmosphere and so on and so forth. This is a subject area called space weather. I will not talk about it uh, today, but uh, one of my students, uh, uh, Ritesh, will be uh, lecturing in one of the e-lecture series on this particular subject. So our coronagraph will uh, be a very, very crucial, you know, uh, data for this kind of study. So as uh, again, as a collage of uh, different coronal mass ejections seen from different coronagraphs. Also, I would like to emphasize this point that uh, we have a coronagraph, we are going to have a coronagraph from our own space platform, but it will be also important to combine this information with other coronagraphs or, you know, related instruments from other, you know, uh, space platform or ground based platforms as well. What I want to emphasize is this modern day uh, solar physics is done by multi wavelength and multi collaboration as well. For that, you need to actually collaborate with large number of people across the globe, which is very interesting to me, actually. Uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, you get bored with you yourself and so on. But when you have a collaboration, it really excites you to, you know, look at different aspects of uh, the same stuff. So multi wavelength observation, multi site observation, uh, collaborating with uh, people across the globe is a key for uh, success of uh, modern day solar observational physics at least. Again, this is a sequence of CMEs which was observed from the, the C1 coronagraph. There is some technical details here. I will not uh, emphasize too much time here because I am running a little short of time now. But uh, what I pointed out here that if this high time plot of this coronal mass ejection, if you see, you see these data points as shown here. Uh, which basically uh, shows you the location of the corona uh, of the coronal mass ejection. This is a, a blob of plasma which travels through the interplanetary space and different locations allows you to calculate its speed and acceleration and so on and so forth. What is to be noted here is that regular observations are not possible very close to the sun. So these are the heights which are close to the sun and as a result if this speed is changing, as you can see, the speed does change in the initial part when it is very close to the sun, it actually accelerates, is not very well studied at all because we don't have observational data. So if you look at the velocity profile, you see here, velocity increases, then it saturates to a value. And from these velocity measurements, actually you are calculating the acceleration. But you don't have data points here. This is a, a theoretical uh, curve, which is been sort of tried, people have tried to connect with your observational data. Uh, it's a, you can say it's a extrapolations and so on. But our understanding of these, uh, you know, regions very close to the sun is very, very limited. So Aditya coronagraph is essentially designed to particularly focus on these regions. So this is our key element of uh, science. Then again, Aditya coronagraph also has a possibility of measuring the coronal field this is an example from a, a theoretical work from uh, one of our colleagues from uh, SESI Kolkata. This is ISER Kolkata, Center for Space Sciences. And they are doing a lot of numerical work where the magnetic field, how it could be during the total solar eclipse, actually they predicted. They predicted the last uh, uh, you know, famous uh, American solar eclipse, uh, you know, how the, con uh, you know, the magnetic uh, uh, structure should be, the global structure should be. So uh, this was a quite a reasonable success because we do not have a direct means of measuring this magnetic field in the higher up in the corona. 
because of very weak signals and so on and so forth. So we are going to attempt to do a spectral polarimetry which will allow us to measure these uh, magnetic field in this uh, you know, outer layers of the sun. So how does the magnetic field change on global scales with, with the different time scale? I mean, as I showed you one image that during uh, solar minima where the magnetic field is normally much weaker, this is uh, again a subject area which uh, one of my students Bibhuti will be talking about uh, based on data taken from Kodai Canal Solar Observatory, how the magnetic field changes on a global scale and uh, with a larger time scale. So here again is a sort of you know, simulation from the Kolkata CC group uh, headed by Dibendu Nandi, where nicely they are showing how this magnetic field structure. This is again theoreticians, uh, you know, uh, you know, work where it, it maps uh, reasonably well the observations which is seen from the coronagraphs, where you see these kind of streamer structures and so on, extended uh, magnetic structure which has its origin from the sun, and these closed field lines and open field lines gives you an indication where these streamers will be. So again, this is an ideal platform where the theoreticians and the observers can work very close together. So we need predictions from theoretical uh, numerical models where we expect what to expect is, is, uh, going, is shown here. So for Aditya, Dipendu and his uh, uh, group is actually responsible for all these theoretical modeling of the global magnetic fixed structures and so on and so forth. So this is again a very good uh, uh, example. Last few minutes, I will talk about uh, that I, uh, whatever I do uh, during our, uh, our regular activities, we also get an opportunity sometimes to enjoy the life through these eclipse expeditions. I was fortunate to go to China with these telescopes way back, uh, 10 years back. Uh, we did observe, we did publish uh, these things. Then uh, we, I had a great opportunity to go to, uh, to Easter Island. Not many people has visited this uh, remote place, a very unique historical place in June 11, 2010. We observed a solar eclipse and we did multi-slit experiment from there. We published those results as well. This is a beautiful island and uh, this is the team which we went with this, uh, you know, with these equipments and, and so on. Why I'm showing this is there is an opportunity coming. Also, it's, it's not a total solar eclipse, but this is just next month. This is an annual solar eclipse and it will be seen from the northern part of India. Uh, and Nanital, we will see almost 95%. I will probably give a talk later on in, uh, in middle of June, uh, only on total solar eclipse and this event. I mean, ideally, we would have loved to host many people in Nanital on uh, this day but it doesn't appear to be uh, you know possible now with the current uh, conditions but uh, we will be uh, streaming live the eclipse uh, whatever we will be observing from here of course uh, weather permitting so this is again a new uh, event which is coming and this is celestial events so you should not miss the opportunity if you get thank you for your attention i think we can take questions if they are there uh, okay Okay, so the first question is from Gaurav, Gaurav Singh. The question is, does solar observatory located in the middle of river or lake helps in better imaging? Yes, very good question and uh, you are right on dot. So, I think I briefly mentioned during my presentation that uh, the lake water actually provides you a natural cooling environment. What happens is, during the course of the day, uh, the ground surface uh, gets heated up and that creates a lot of turbulence and those uh, heating turbulence actually deteriorates the image quality. So if you have a water body near your telescope that provides you with this you know passive cooling and that cooling helps in the image quality. So again your question is very nice and, and direct it does help a big way. So people in the past actually either the big bear solar observatory is actually liquidated in a lake of course in a, in hawaii in the mountain they do not have a lake but in himalaya that's a fortunate thing which we have we have the mountain and the lake both so this is uh, actually the probably one of the best sites in the world so a combination of lake and the mountain again gorov has another question um, Sir, there are various satellites already stabilized at L1 point between Sun and Earth. 
how Aditya's orbit will be able to function without getting interfered with other satellites. Okay, again a good point, but I did not emphasize that. Actually, though it is called a Lagrangian one point, uh, these satellites will be making a very big halo orbit around this Lagrangian point. So that orbit is very, very long and it, uh, the, the satellite moves very slowly. So essentially in space, as you know, it is very difficult to stay in one place in any case. So the solution is that uh, once you reach this uh, so-called stable position of Lagrangian 1, you make a very uh, you know, big uh, halo orbit around it. So as uh, you can imagine now, uh, even if you have uh, probably hundreds of thousands of satellites, it will not really collide with each other because they are moving very slow either. I mean also. Uh, next question is from Harshita Gandhi. Does uh, flux cancellation give rise to formation of spicules around sunspot or it just provides energy to the spicules? Okay, good question. So the example which I was showing about spicules are more of a actually uh, quiet sun phenomena because uh, they are everywhere on the sun. So you do not need actually a sunspot to have a spicule because these opposite polarity magnetic flux concentrations are there everywhere on the sun and whenever there is a flux cancellation that is leading to a spicule. Whereas sunspots also get jets. In fact, since you asked the question, you can have a situation where opposite magnetic polarities get cancelled to each other within a sunspot and that actually does give rise to uh, big uh, you know uh, jets as well so those are solar jets often seen uh, from sunspots and they are much much longer and more energetic as well so there are jets uh, seen uh, within sunspots or at the boundaries of the sunspot often because you know in the sunspot boundary there are more possibilities of flux cancellations and so on uh, next question is from Orpon Hathi sir we know from Planck distribution that intensity of visible lights are maximum since temperature of sun surface is 5800 Kelvin. So if we use infrared telescope then the intensity of sun surface will decrease or not. You are again right partially. Uh, when we look at infrared wavelengths the total intensity or uh, the luminosity of the sun within those uh, you know selected uh, wavelength will be much less than the optical wave band. So effectively it will mean that you have to uh, give a correct exposure time for your images to be taken. Again, having said that your infrared imaging camera may not have the same sensitivity as optical camera and so on and so forth. Sometimes these days the infrared cameras are actually coming very sensitive. So they can take very, very short exposures and so on. So this question is actually valid for other wavelengths also. In fact, incidentally, as you rightly pointed out, if you look at the Planck's uh, black body curve for the sun, it peaks at uh, you know, 6000 Kelvin. So majority of the emission is actually from the optical region. And if you go to near UV, your emission is much, much weaker. But uh, as I pointed out again, that uh, you have to calculate how much photons you are getting from in these wavelength bands. So depending on your camera and optics, you have to decide on your exposure time. So uh, it's possible to take uh, images. But one need not compare the images which one will take from the optical wavelength and near UV. In fact, incidentally, with the camera which uh, we'll be having on Aditya, these are scientific CMOS cameras. There we can give for, for optical wavelength a 10 millisecond exposure because that's good enough. We have a lot of photons, as you rightly pointed out. Whereas if you want to go for uh, a near UV, the uh, the other, other uh, telescope which is built in Ayuka, they will need to give an exposure time very close to almost a second. So you can imagine because of the sensitivity and the number of photons which will be collected. Okay, so the next question is from <coughs> Shubrato Singh. What is the time period that Aditya is going to work for us? Okay, uh, so there is, uh, for any space uh, program or space uh, project, there is something called a nominal life. Nominal life means in optimum condition, that is the period over which you expect that satellite to last. So for Aditya, the nominal life is actually five years. So we hope at least it will be there for five years. 
but uh, our expectation is that it will be uh, lasting longer as well. Next uh, question is from Abhash uh, Pradhan. Sir, considering both these facilities, Aditya and NRST, would be operating at the time of peak of solar cycle 25, what advantages would we have from having two different viewpoints, especially regarding observations of CMEs? Again, very good question. And in fact, that is one of the main um, you know, drive for us to get the National Large Solar Telescope also uh, up and approved uh, as soon as possible. Because as you pointed out, the solar cycle 25, which is expected in four or five years time from now, see the coronagraph will look at the CMEs in the outer atmosphere. Coronagraph will not have any information where this CME is coming from. Now we understand that these CMEs are coming from those active regions where there are strong magnetic fields. And this magnetic field, complexity of the magnetic field, their evolution, their cancellations are actually leading to a flare and, and eventually a CME. So to get to know about these uh, details of the magnetic field, we need to look at a ground-based facility. And uh, NLST, we have our focus is actually on the magnetic field observation. You are absolutely right and that's what our focus is to get a very detailed study of the magnetic field evolution on the surface of the sun and also actually we are aiming to do it in the chromosphere also. So we will have possibilities of doing infrared observations because it is a mountain site. It does uh, allow to look at some of the infrared wavelengths as well. If you are in a uh, Delhi or something, you will hardly see any infrared emission from the sky. But uh, in the high up in the mountain, you still get a lot of infrared uh, you know, emission. So we are expecting some infrared observations from magnetic measurements in the chromosphere as well, which is uh, the layer about 2000 kilometers from the surface uh, to understand these semi evolutions and so on. Uh, next question is from Pradeep uh, Chakravarti. Uh, what are the basic differences between Parker and Aditya L1 mission? As an eminent solar scientist as well director Aries, what is your planning to integrate Aries with Aditya mission as well as enhancing solar observational facilities within Aries? Pradeep, it is a difficult question to answer because uh, I have just taken charge in a few months back and as you can see that it takes a uh, lot of time to uh, develop a new facility and plan for it. But having said that, of course, I will try. Uh, I will try to put, uh, you know, Aries to have a, also a ground-based facility from Devastan. That would be my dream, but it is not going to happen in a year or two. It is a very, very long-term plan. Now, coming back to your first question about uh, difference between Parker and Aditya, so, uh, you know, um, L1 mission. Parker Solar Probe is a completely different ball game. Parker Solar Probe is going much closer to the sun and it is having actually a combination of instruments which will look at the heliosphere to study the solar wind and a lot of detection of energetic particles when it is traveling between sun and earth. Since Parker Solar Probe is actually going so close to the sun, it is not able to look at the sun directly at all because it's too hot. So what it is doing actually, it's looking away from the sun. So if something comes out of the sun, it will be able to capture that. So this is a called a combination of heliospheric image and an outer coronagraph and so on. It will not have possibility or it doesn't have, uh, you know, instruments which will look at the sun. Since you asked this question, this is again a very, very important, uh, uh, you know, area. If we can combine the data from Aditya L1, which is going to look at directly to the sun, and also it has a particle detectors when the particles are actually traveling between the sun and the, and it, teach, uh, it hits the uh, you know uh, Aditya payloads, and Parker Solar Probe is actually a at a different vantage point. So when you combine these informations as collected from different vantage points, you can actually reconstruct what is happening on the sun, back projected and so on. So there are a lot of important signs can be done if one can combine the data from Parker Solar Probe and Aditya L1. This is, this is one of our main science objectives as well. Then the question is from uh, uh, Vishnu Patel. 
uh, what is the physical significance of magnetic field of sun as we know that earth magnetic field protects us from solar particles yes again a good question um, so the most uh, significant part of the sun's magnetic field is that we understand now that the dynamics of the sun whatever you know big uh, changes is happening in the sun and the solar atmosphere and and these big flares and explosions coronal uh, mass ejections they are all due to reconfigurations of magnetic field different forms of magnetic field they interact with each, each other and as a result we get these kind of uh, you know huge explosions apart from that sun is also a magnetic star essentially this magnetic field, what we are seeing in the surface of the sun, is actually getting generated inside the sun through a process called what we understand dynamo. It's like you know your standard dynamo on the on your bicycle. So because of the combination of the rotation and convection inside the sun, this magnetic field is generated. So to understand why first of all there is a magnetic field and how this magnetic field is changing with time of different time scale is one of the most interesting and challenging you know subject areas what we work on so uh, there is a huge significance if you have to just answer in one way what is the physical significance of magnetic field you see whatever changes is happening in the sun now we understand is because of the changes in the magnetic field so unless we understand in the first place how this magnetic field is generated why this magnetic field is changing and if we understand why it is changing can we predict how it will change tomorrow so these are the areas where we work on so it's very very significant uh, Nitin Ratnakar uh, the question is sir how can I join Aries or uh, these type of space projects okay so um, see Aries uh, being a uh, you know primary research institute it's uh, it has a very strong PhD program. So if you have already done uh, your masters, then you can apply for uh, PhD. There are uh, several national exams, uh, which you can also qualify through. And once you quali qualify any of these exams like test or net or get, then you can apply through an online process. Incidentally, this online application uh, portal is open now. So if you have completed your masters, if you are an undergraduate student, then there are provisions for short term visits or projects. Those projects, if it is part of your curriculum in the university or institutions wherever you are studying, then uh, you have to apply in Aries again through an online application process. And if you are selected, then you can do a short term project for this. Now your question is uh, how to join these kind of space projects. Of course, you can join these kind of uh, projects if you if you work with the people who are directly involved with these projects and often these projects uh, also advertise for uh, positions of uh, PhDs and postdocs and scientists and so on. So uh, one can do that. What we are also planning uh, for Aditya is to have several uh, workshops. Actually our plan was uh, to have one of the workshops in, in coming months but I do not know with the current circumstances whether we will be able to do that. But um, in near future, we will be uh, conducting such workshops and where we will be sort of training youngsters, uh, you know, uh, what it is Aditya all about, what kind of Aditya data, uh, you know, uh, will be, uh, you know, available for the community to work on and so on. So, but basically, as you can imagine, that all these needs a, is a little bit of formal training. So, unless you know the techniques, to do a, a research level uh, you know, work uh, is becomes di difficult. Having said that, of course, you can play around with a lot of images uh, which will be uh, uh, you know, easily available through our uh, portal and so on and so forth once the Aditya data comes in. Uh, in terms of other projects where I'm involved, where the data is, this Kodekinal digitization program where I was PI for many years. So all that data is in the public domain now. So you can uh, download the data and do some work I have uh, several PhD students who are working on this. You can get in touch with them and uh, try to contribute there as well. So I hope uh, that answers your query. I have, uh, okay, there are more questions, okay. Uh, question from Jayalakshmi. How much is the strength of small scale background magnetic field? Is there any contribution from them towards progress of the solar cycle? Well, 
I did not talk about anything about the background magnetic field. Uh, there are work on this, uh, you know, whether there is a sort of small little background field which changes over many uh, years and so on and so forth. There are work. Uh, Abhi, uh, uh, one of our former students, have worked on this. There are a couple of, uh, you know, Gauss magnetic field changes. One also have uh, reported about this uh, background magnetic field change. It probably does contribute into the total uh, luminosity of the sun irradiance, but still it is not very well understood yet. So it's a you know it's a work which is uh, in progress. Uh, next question is from Sheet Pal. I'd like to be part of technology development for astronomical instrumentation. Kindly let me the possibilities to involve in these technology development of astronomy. Uh, I can talk about uh, Aries at this point of time. Uh, because uh, Aries uh, also have a uh, very good engineering division and uh, we have uh, optics lab, we have mechanical workshops, we have nighttime uh, telescopes which is maintained by you know uh, our engineers and students as well. So you can get in touch with, uh, with our uh, people in, uh, in Aries and uh, look for opportunities for short term projects and all that. But I mean, you know there are many requests uh, it comes and unless it is part of a curriculum or you know some form of uh, background is there for you it becomes difficult as to accommodate because as you can imagine we are in a quite a little isolated place incidentally it is raining heavily now outside uh, it was sunny uh, just one hour back so uh, weather ch uh, uh, do change uh, very drastically I didn't expect any rain today <laughs> I hope you can hear me rather than the raindrops <laughs> Uh, so again, coming back to your question, there are opportunities, uh, write to us and uh, we can put you into touch uh, with other people. You can write to me as well. Next question is from Jayanand Mayura. How solar disk is blocked for corona observation? What are the challenges in doing so? Okay, good question and there are challenges. So essentially, uh, this is the device called uh, coronagraph. So you can imagine that you you take a, a, a circular plate and hold it between you and the sun, right? And you can try to block the solar disk. But you will not actually block the disk if you just hold it like that, right? There will be a lot of light which will be passing through the edges of this disk. So there are a combination of uh, certain optical elements which can be used to block this. So this uh, device is called a coronagraph and it has two types of coronagraph. One is called internal coronagraph and one is called external coronagraph. Internal coronagraph is that uh, you somehow to block the light internally within your telescope. Somehow you have to get rid of the disk light. You can think it that way. In fact, Aditya L1 coronagraph is an internally operated coronagraph. We which is sort of uh, the it's a off axis uh, you know telescope so the main light goes into a primary mirror and it's a hyperbola and the and the uh, the beam goes into a, a secondary mirror where there is a hole in the secondary mirror and that hole size is actually the size of the disk in that particular optical uh, element so the light actually goes out of the hole and in the rim of this secondary mirror, whatever light is reflected, that is the coronal emission, which gets then imaged in subsequent optical element. So this is called an internal occulter. And also you can have an external occulter. That means, you know, you can uh, have this uh, disk slightly away from your, you know, uh, primary and so on. So these are slight technical, uh, you know, diagrams are necessary to uh, to explain these things. If you are interested, you get back to me, I can give you references. Incidentally, since you asked the question, there is actually a technology demonstration mission called Proba 3, which will try to create an artificial eclipse in the, in the space by using two different satellites. One satellite, which is ahead of the one which is behind, will act as this occulter. So the first satellite will block the solar disk image and uh, the second satellite will image the corona. So that's how the occultation is done. So there are challenges because, you know, uh, there were a lot of light which gets scattered from this and then there are some images sometimes uh, ghosting and so, and so on. If there is any small little particle 
you know, uh, anywhere in the, within your telescope that will, uh, you know, introduce some kind of scattered light which will spoil your uh, original image. So there are a lot of, lot of challenges uh, in this kind of uh, instruments. Uh, next question is by Kumar Hemant. Uh, for last several months, no sunspot is visible. Can we guess when in future sunspot will be visible? Yeah, again, this is a good question. We are undergoing through the solar minima. That means uh, uh, there are uh, not many such spots on the solar disk in many days. Uh, this is again an uh, area called, uh, can you predict when this such spot uh, will start appearing? When, um, how many will be appearing and when will be the next solar maxima? Uh, my student Bibhuti will be talking about it in his uh, next uh, lecture in coming weeks. But uh, since you asked the question, it appears that there have been some sunspot visible on the sun and that people are claiming belongs to the next cycle. So, so it appears that the new, new cycle has already started uh, you know, uh, appearing. But again, this is a speculation. There is no confirmation yet. But this is probably going to be true. Uh, next question is by Sarvan Kumar. Can the upcoming solar facility in Ladakh allow to use of the facility of Indian University students which are not part of this project? Of course you can. You see, these are national facilities. And once the facilities are up, uh, the access to the facilities will be uh, for everybody, everyone in, in India. So there is definite possibility of you know, participation in all national programs. This is, this is taxpayers' money. So there is no exclusive data rights with uh, anybody. But, you know, as having said that, you need certain experience, certain, uh, you know, <coughs> certain exposure to be able to use the telescope. So there are standard procedure, you have to apply for time, and there will be committee which will uh, evaluate your proposal, what kind of science you want to do, what kind of instrument you want to use, and whether you understand how the instruments operate. So if the committee is satisfied, then they will give you a provision to, uh, you know, use the facility. That's how it works. Uh, Orpon Ghosh, question is, can we use astronomical telescope, uh, can we use for solar telescope, vice versa, provided the instruments are provided? Uh, it's a good challenging question. In fact, it is possible to use some of the solar telescope for night observation. Uh, because, uh, for example, this uh, National Large Solar Telescope, we still have a provision of using it in the night. Because it is a standard, uh, you know, <coughs> Cassegrain, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, on-axis uh, system. So the primary mirror is two meter. It collects a lot of photons. So if you look at the sky, uh, you can observe any object in the sky. Sometimes there is certain limitations of tracking those objects, uh, what location you can go, and so on. But in NLST, there won't be much, uh, you know, limitations on that. On the other hand. The nighttime telescopes is difficult to be used for solar telescopes because they are not designed for collecting that much of photon. What happens is when the primary mirror looks at the sun, it, uh, it actually collects hundreds of kilowatt of power. So this huge amount of power you have to get rid of from the telescope, secondary and so on and so forth. Before it reaches the secondary, you have to get rid of that. So this is something called a heat stop for a solar telescope. So if a heat stop is not there for a nighttime telescope, uh, it cannot be used for, I mean, your optics will get burned in no time. So to answer is again, a nighttime telescope to be used in, in, uh, in for daytime observation is much more challenging. You have to make a lot of modifications in your uh, telescope to do that. The other way, a, a solar telescope can be used for nighttime telescope. Uh, as a nighttime uh, facility, uh, provided you have this uh, proper backend instruments and so on for that. Now, the next question is from Siddhipa. How much uh, Starlink project affecting the ground-based optical and radio observation? Uh, I have to recall what is, uh, you see, there was a Starlink project uh, in UK. I do not know whether you are referring to that. I'm afraid I'm not able to link uh, which project you are referring to. I'm sorry for that because Starlink was a big project in UK. Uh, there may be something with same name, but uh, I'm, I'm not getting it right away. So I have to get back to you. Maybe you can write to me uh, later on. New set of questions. Starlink is, uh, oh, SpaceX satellite constellation. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay. 
So this is a SpaceX, uh, you know, program, which is named as uh, Starlink now. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, any, any space program, it has to be a little bit careful about uh, space debris and, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, polluting the space. So essentially, this is again another area which, uh, which the next generation has to work about is uh, called the space debris like how much uh, uh, pollution you are, ca are causing in the space because some of those uh, um, you know constellations or even uh, multitudes of objects in the sky they can come uh, in your line of sight when you are observing from the ground so it does uh, provide uh, you know certain uh, hindrance i'll put it that way but i think the numbers are still not uh, that much to affect it but one should be careful about it so it is it is a definite uh, uh, definite concern for future yeah one more question new one okay so the last question which is coming is from arpit srivastava we have two questions okay uh, first one is how coronagraph will be able to help in coronal heating problem okay so this corona uh, graph have a, a combined ability of doing imaging and uh, spectroscopy so particularly from the spectroscopy channel we'll be able to detect these waves and as i mentioned that uh, waves are considered to be one of the major player for carrying this energy from the lower atmosphere to the higher atmosphere and dumping their energy into the higher heights and when they dump their energy to the higher heights also it it uh, produces heating that means you know temperature will change and that temperature change you will see with the uh, with, uh, with the time variation that whenever there is a wave it will heat sometimes the wave presence could be intermittent and so on and so forth so all these can be done from the coronagraph and uh, the coronagraph has a capability of imaging and spectroscopy with a very high cadence that means you know very frequent images we will be able to take in, take many many images in a second so very fast moving waves also can be captured by that so that's the idea. The next question is how are uh, we going to be just one second? Uh, how are we going to protect the instruments in Aditya from highly energetic particles coming from the sun? This is again a very good question. Uh, so uh, most of the instruments <coughs> actually, when they're tested at the ground, they're tested for this uh, particle bombardments as well, because uh, as you rightly uh, pointed out we will not have much control on uh, you know changing anything or suddenly uh, you know closing the telescopes and so on when we are in uh, lagrangian one point because since we are going also far away from uh, earth we actually do not have a direct link there are some emergency uh, uh, links available so the instruments cannot be actually instantaneously operated it's not like you know you click a mouse here and then something uh, happens in the space you have to load all your programs or modes of observation one day in advance 24 hours in advance you have to tell what the instruments will be doing so to again coming back to your uh, question uh, it is not possible actually to do uh, much uh, when such particles are going to hit it will affect certain images and those images we will try to uh, try to process it later on to get rid of uh, some of those uh, you know particle hits or events but uh, the instruments are designed in such a way that they can withstand such particle bombardment so it is a part of the uh, you know exercise that instruments have to be built in such a way that they can withstand such a particle shower okay so if uh, these are the questions uh, i will again remind you that these are the uh, 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 you know e lecture series if someone has missed uh, today's uh, live lecture, they can uh, find it from Aries uh, Facebook page and also on Aries YouTube channel. So Aries has uh, its own Facebook and uh, YouTube channel. So one can just uh, go to those uh, channels and find the recording of these. Uh, the link to those sites are available on Aries uh, official uh, website. So please visit Aries website. Some of your questions in terms of our our opportunities and uh, students program and all that you can also get it from those edis website you can also submit your questions later on and also provide your feedback by using the link available below the videos so uh, please uh, you know visit uh, the site again and if you uh, if you pose your uh, new questions and feedback 
uh, we'll try to address them. And feedback is always very good, uh, whether it was uh, boring, whether it was interesting, whether it was useful. So this kind of feedback also helps us to prepare for the next lecture. So uh, I will be coming back again live probably after several weeks. Uh, and I will be talking about uh, the annual uh, solar eclipse and some of my experiences from total solar eclipses and also famous discoveries which were made during solar eclipses uh, centuries of years back. Thank you.